Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I heard the little commercial at the beginning. 50 years of the South Dakota Festival of Books. Maybe you'll donate $50 to help this thing going. Well, science fiction had a birthday recently, too. It had its 200th birthday in 2018. That makes it 204. So anybody wants to give me a couple of hundred dollars at the end of this, on behalf of the genre, I will gratefully accept it for the good of the, uh, the field, you understand. Science fiction is interesting. It's one of only two genres, two fields of writing, where we can actually pinpoint the birth date to a specific work. Mystery is the other one. Edgar Allan Poe invented the modern mystery novel with murders in the Rue Morgue. Uh, but I'm here to talk about science fiction. And the first work of science fiction, there was a lot of debate about this in, uh, in, in academia. Uh, and I, I, I was just saying to Patrick here, I go every year to a conference in Florida called the International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts. It's a wonderful, I'm gonna say it's a wonderful scam because it's in March break and it's academics who teach science fiction from all over the world who have contrived to convince their department heads to send them to Florida in March break on the department's money. And they have to performatively uh, give papers there. And I was noted to be hanging around the pool instead of uh, going to the papers. And one of the academics came up to me and said, Rob, I notice you don't go to many of the presentations here. And I said, it's a lot to ask the frog to go to biology class. <laughs> so in the academic part of this field, there's been a lot of debate. There was a lot of debate, definitively concluded, about when science fiction began. People talked about Greek myth. People talked of Lucian of Samosota. People talked about all kinds of things. And then Brian Aldiss, who was a friend of mine since passed away, Brian Aldiss came along and said, made the definitive case that science fiction was born in 18, uh, 18, I can never do my math right. It was born 204 years ago. Somebody in the audience can do the math later. It was born in 1818, excuse me. And the father of science fiction wasn't a father at all. The father of science fiction was a mother. This is a genre created by a woman. That woman was Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, Mary Shelley. And the first work of science fiction was a novel called Frankenstein. It also has a subtitle. And I must say the subtitle is much more interesting than Herman Melville, who's often thought of as a, uh, you know, a great novelist. Moby Dick, the subtitle of Moby Dick is, or The Whale. It's a little on the nose. Mary Shelley's subtitle is uh, Frankenstein, or anybody know the subtitle? The, Patrick? The modern Prometheus, even though it's 200 years ago, it was modern for the time. The modern Prometheus, which is a nice allusion. And it's allusion to Greek myth, the myth of uh, Prometheus who stole the secret of fire from the gods. What secret did Frankenstein steal? We'll get to that in a second. Why is this the first science fiction novel? It is the first novel that embraces scientific inquiry. The main character, there were many novels about magic and, and superpowers and so forth, but they were distinctly presented as being superpowers. Faust makes a deal with the devil, a supernatural deal. Frankenstein doesn't refer to the monster. Frankenstein is the surname of the, ironically, not the protagonist of the novel and actually the antagonist in the novel, but he is Dr. Victor Frankenstein. He's a man of science, a medical man, and he takes into his mindset the currently prevailing scientific theories of his day. And amongst the things that people were talking about a lot in the late uh, 18, uh, sorry, in the early 1800s was galvanism, named for an Italian scientist, Galvani, who had explored the notion that electricity was somehow central to life. He noted that they knew about electric eels. He also knew, speaking of those frogs in biology class, if you give a little zip of electricity to a dead frog leg, it'll do this, it'll shake. So he realized, Galdani was writing about the fact that there was some relationship to electricity and what's called the quickening, the bringing to life of something. Well, Mary Shelley was aware of the science of her day, as was her character, Dr. Victor Frankenstein. And Victor Frankenstein devised a theory. This is the first 
work of fiction that embraces the scientific method. His theory, or his hypothesis, I should say, his hypothesis was if you were to apply electricity in sufficient quantity to dead matter, you could reanimate that matter. Now he conducts an experiment, an experiment, part two of the scientific method, hypothesis experiment, to test, to prove or to falsify what your scientific notion is. And everybody knows the experiment, even if you've never read the book, and I commend the book to you, by the way. Uh, it's an excellent book, but everybody knows the Frankenstein character from Boris Karloff's uh, very uh, limited interpretation of what's actually in the novel. So she, uh, he, Victor, has a theory, a hypothesis, excuse me, an idea he wants to test. He tests it by conducting an experiment. He manages to reanimate a body that he's assembled from different parts that he's been man managed to, through nefarious means, acquire. And what happens is a quickening, a coming to life. Frankenstein's creature. We tend to say Frankenstein's monster. It's not called the monster in the book, it's the creature, which means created, something created. Created, comes to life. And this is why Victor is the antagonist and why everybody should read science fiction, because what happens in the novel is Victor abandons the creature, doesn't care anything about what happens to the creature, was only dispassionately <clears throat> interested in the science of, uh, that he had in his mind. Could I do this? And yeah, I could do it. Now, why is this interesting? Why does this novel resonate? And why is it important that it was written by Mary Shelley, by a woman who lived very much at that time and for many years in literary history continued to live on in the shadow of her husband, the great poet Percy Bysshe Shelley? Why is that significant? Because what Mary Shelley was doing was what science fiction has gone on to do ever more ever since, which is to ask interesting philosophical questions. What she said was, what if, and this is one of the central story generative engines for creating science fiction, a what if question, what if men had the power of giving life that heretofore had been reserved only for women? Interesting question. And Mary Shelley, the reason that her novel, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, is very frequently taught as the first text in a survey of science fiction course. It's also very frequently taught in another uh, branch of the academy, another field of study. Anybody know what that field is? Anybody want to take a guess? Philosophy, Philosophy is a good guess. And not a bad one, I, I, I commend you for it. <laughs> but it's women's studies, it's feminist studies. Because what Mary Shelley was saying is, what if we took the power that defines in her era, the only way it could be defined really in her era, uh, being a, a biological woman, and gave that to a man, what would happen? And what she said, this is another central tenet of science fiction, it was a cautionary tale, there was no possibility of men having anything to do with women's reproductive rights in 1818, but it was certainly gonna come down the pike, either legislatively or in terms of biotechnology as we moved along. And she said, well, it would be a disaster because men, and this is a 1818 conception of womanhood, but it's a very interesting one for its era, men lack the nurturing qualities that women have. Men are only interested in that moment of creation, that one moment of creation. They have a great time with that moment of creation. And then they say, okay, I'll call you in the morning, and often they don't, and they dispense with responsibility for their creation. Whereas women, because of the biological process of developing uh, a child within their body for nine months and then the necessity, especially in Mary Shelley's day when there weren't artificial alternatives, of providing the sustenance for that body, the nurturing of that body, women are biologically predisposed in 1818 to be nurturers of new life and men are biologically predisposed because of their very minuscule role in the creation of life to be discarders of new life. And so she made a very interesting, very prescient, when we look back at it from two centuries difference, distance, very prescient observation about the role of men related to reproduction 
hitherto an exclusively female uh, province of control. Very profound novel, very feminist novel, very interesting novel. And that's what science fiction has long strove to do. Now, I mentioned that Mary Shelley is the mother of science fiction. It's really more appropriate to call her the grandmother of science fiction. Because science fiction has two fathers. Uh, one is English, Great Britain, and one is French, from France. I have to make that distinction because in Canada we think, oh, somebody from Ontario versus somebody from Quebec. <laughs> England and France, which also use those languages that we use in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, obviously, the French one, Jules Verne, who came first, and the English one, H.G. Herbert George, H.G. Wells, who came second. They knew of each other. They didn't like each other. In particular, Verne did not like Wells, because uh, Verne, Verne is also, there, there, there's another genre, I was, I, this just occurs to me now, but there's a third genre that really, in a significant way, you can trace its birthplace to a particular writer and a particular person, that's Jules Verne and the techno-thriller, the Tom Clancy kind of novel. Uh, if you read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is 20,000 Leagues that way, horizontal, not that way, because you get, get it right down through the crust if you're going down, horizontally 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. If you read it, you will find actually it should have, in a, in a uh, uh, Herman Melville style, Herman Melville, right, on the nose, it's uh, Moby Dick or The Whale. And if you've read that, and we in Canada dodge that bullet, by the way. In the States, I know most of you have to read it in the literature course. And what you will remember if you've read it in the literature course, I've, I've read it subsequently, but wasn't forced to read it, um, is that every other chapter has nothing to do with the plot. It's a textbook on whaling and how you flence blubber from whalebone, and all these things that are completely irrelevant to the plot. Half the book is that. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is the same thing. It should have, if Verne had had the, uh, the same uh, sense of being on the nose as um, Herman Melville, but 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, or comma, the submarine, because it is every other chapter is a discourse on the mechanisms of the Nautilus, Captain Nemo's submarine, or on some aspect of ichthyology or something else that they discover. Half of that book is superfluous to the story. So Jules Verne is the least interesting, the lesser interesting, less interesting, of the two fathers of science fiction. H.G. Wells, who Verne called in French a snot nose kid, H.G. Uh, Wells came along and he was not particularly interested. I say particularly because he did pay some attention to the science and uh, logic behind what he was writing, but what he was more writing, interested in writing about and what he is the father of in terms of science fiction, building on Mary Shelley, is that science fiction is principally not a mode about the submarine or the spaceship, or even in H.G. Wells' case, the on-the-nose title, The Time Machine, a title so good that we have no other term for that device. Whenever we talk about a mechanic, mechanical method for traveling backward or forward in time, we use Wells' coinage, the time machine. It's right on the nose, and he has certainly, especially in the opening chapters, um, in fact, uh, the opening chapter, the first sentence, says the time traveler, uh, so it will be convenient to refer to him, was recounting and recondite matter to us, meaning a complex and difficult to comprehend matter, recondite matter. And he goes into why time travel might be theoretically possible. But Wells gets that all out of the way in the first chapter, which is a charming Victoria area, uh, Victorian era dinner party in the home of the person who was known as the time traveler. Um, and he gets on to what he wants to do. Now, the time machine which Wells is the first of the two Wells works I'm going to talk about here. The Time Machine, first in terms of writing, 1895, uh, is not about time travel from the end of the uh, 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, to the year 802-701 AD. It has nothing to do with that. H.G. Wells, who was in his day 
best known, uh, became best known as a historian, a popular, a writer of popular history. Uh, he would be kind of like a, to his contemporaries thought of as a Shelby Foote kind of person, the great chronicler of your civil war, not mine, yours. Own it. H.G. <laughs> uh, Wells um, was mostly a popular historian, but what he wanted to say with, uh, and he was also a social reformer, what he wanted to say was the time machine was something that he felt his fellow uh, members of British society, upper crust. By upper crust, you know, British is, Britain is still more than the United States or Canada, still very much a class-based society. You stand, tend to be born at an income level. They don't have the American dream that through hard work you can, you know, just rise to whatever level of your, your skill and your talent and your uh, perseverance can take you to. It's not part of the British mythos. So they have a class-based society. Now, Wells had a readership. What did that mean? He had literate audience that excluded a large part of the people in Britain at that time. So the people he was talking to were not everybody. He was talking to A, that portion of the audience that was literate, B, that portion of the audience that had disposable income to spend on a frivolous luxury item known as books. He was talking to people like himself and he had something he wanted to say to them. But he also knew that they would not listen to him if he put on his historian hat or if he put on just a public persona and said, listen, you guys, I want to tell you something. So he decided to disguise what he wanted to say with masks, with metaphors, with displacement in time, in his particular case, these are the common tools of a science fiction writer, their displacement in time, the far future, the ancient past, displacement in space, somewhere uh, off Earth, another planet, another solar system perhaps, displacement in time, and he wanted to say this to the British public of his strata. The British class system sucks. That's what he wanted to say. And he wanted to say it and have people pay attention to him. So what he wanted to say was, everybody said, yeah, you know, it's really bad for those poor people. I mean, I, I sympathize with Bob Cratchit. You know, he's got a raw deal off of Scrooge. Everybody understood that. It's bad not just for the bad Bob Cratchits, he wanted to say. It's bad for the Ebenezer Scrooges. It's bad for those who have money and have power and are on top. Why is that? This is because if you just sit on the top and let others do all the work and all the thinking for you, beneath you, you are going to, and this was very much uh, on everybody's mind at the time, Charles Darwin and evolutionary theory, you were going to devolve. You're going to lose your position on top. It's not a tenable, stable uh, sociological system to have a class so stratified, class system so stratified. And so what he did was he projected forward and showed that in the far future that what would happen to the previous ruling class was that they would become, in fact, feeble of mind and feeble of body, incapable of looking after any need whatsoever, dependent entirely on what had been the rude, rough, and tumble working class. And his Eloy, his, his uh, highly uh, devolved upper class, and his Morlocks, the lower class underneath, would in fact be a reversal. The Morlocks are actually in charge. The lower class actually is herding, not listening, but herding like cattle, human beings. You get to live so long as a Morlock isn't hungry, and then if they're hungry, you can become a food source. So way before Charlton Heston said, Soylent Green is, oh, no spoiler alerts here. But way before he said that, H.G. Wells was saying that. And it was very much a trenchant social commentary. Now, why did he want to do that that way? Because people who would not normally predis be, be predisposed to listen to that sort of argument were sucked in by what they thought was an entertaining, lightweight thing. We didn't have the term science fiction. That term was coined uh, in 1926 by Hugo Gernsback, after whom the top science fiction award, which I'm lucky enough to have the Hugo Award, is named. So this is uh, almost 30 years before that term came into currency. So Wells called this stuff scientific romances. And by romances from the uh, Latin and French for roman, for a novel, 
it just meant, you know, it, he was trying to suck people into reading these things, thinking that they were escapism, but they are not. Well, it's the second great science fiction novel, uh, which also actually has a pretty on-the-nose title. He was famous for that. Uh, the Invisible Man is another one, and From the Earth to the Moon is another one. He liked to do that sort of thing. Uh, but um, the second one that I'm going to talk about briefly is The War of the Worlds, right on target. And he says to people, hey, here's a novel about Martians attacking Earth. Nobody had ever written that, by the way, previously. This was, he invented the alien invasion story, which we still have summer blockbusters and TV series and endless novels based on still. And oh, wow, I want to read that. That sounds exciting and fun. And it was exciting and fun and new at the time that he did it. It wasn't, oh, I saw Independence Day. I saw Will Smith before he slapped Chris Rock, and I still liked him back then. I saw that. This was new and fresh. But his agenda had nothing to do with warning Earth that Martians might invade us. He wanted to talk about another social issue that bothered him greatly, that concerned him as a social reformer. He said, here I am in, and you know, I often say that the most hubristic term that humanity has ever uh, coined is the one that uh, Carl Linnaeus gave our species. He's the person who named us Homo sapiens, which means man or person, the wise, the wise people. There's a lot of hubris in that, if you're going to name yourself something, right? Because uh, demonstrably not a lot of wisdom scattered amongst uh, the currently 7 billion of us. But um, he gave us that name. Another kind of hubristic name from not an, a, a dissimilar time in history is Great Britain. I mean, you know, I understand in the United States there's a current slogan, there's some guy, I can't remember his name, who was using it, Make America Great again, but it's not the great United States of America as your official name, but Great Britain, that's quite hubristic. And uh, Wells said, look, we have gone all over the planet and we have colonized all sorts of places, including here, and I was very pleased to hear a land acknowledgement as part of uh, the opening uh, ceremony that we had for the South Dakota Festival of Books last night, including here in the United States, Canada, my country, which is currently still wrestling with its, in fact, we're very much at a, uh, a tipping point because, of course, our head of state, the Queen of Canada, just passed away. And we have a new head of state, Charles III is King of Canada, and some other places too, um, wrestling with this notion of Great Britain and whether that adjective great is really applicable to what Britain was doing. So Wells contrived a novel that said, if you stop and think about it, what if the shoe were on the other foot? And although it's called War of the Worlds, the entire novel is set in Southern England. The entire novel is about, in fact, an invasion, yes, putatively happening all over the planet, but all we ever see is it happening in Great Britain. And Wells devises these, uh, if you've seen a good, well, there actually isn't any good film adaptation in terms of fidelity to the original story. It's a great story to read. But he has tripods that stride over the land. Now, you think about a tripod. There are two ways you can have a tripod. You can have a tripod with a third leg out back, but that's not what Wells meant. He meant a big third phallic leg out front. He meant Great Britain striding with this image of macho imperialism all over the planet and crushing, and this is the chapter title, again, a little bit on the nose, chapter title of one of his chapters is called Underfoot, crushing indigenous culture underfoot. And he's asking his readers, again, that privileged class who was literate and could afford books, to think about, hey, what would you think if another power invaded us and wiped out our indigenous culture? and uh, left us you know, uh, uh, as uh, scrambling for any kind of existence. In the wake of that, he was very much talking about social issues. Now, I know some of you, because I heard a little chatter while I was getting ready to talk, have, uh, of course, read science fiction. And some of you, I hope, have not, because I'm here to evangelize a little bit for the genre. It's a waste if I'm just preaching to the converted, right? Uh, but. Uh, for me, for many years, it took me a while to have this epiphany. I was eight years old 
when two, everybody agrees that these belong in the top 10 science fiction films of all time. They just don't agree what order to put them on this list. But in 1968, two seminal science fiction films appeared. Anybody know what they were? Even 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the other one? Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes. Now, many of you, this is one of the problems that science fiction has overall, is there's a tendency for the public to vaguely remember science fiction and dumb it down to being something for children in their mind. And even, I gotta say, the franchise masters, the people who actually own the intellectual property, tend to take what was designed for adults and with each subsequent iteration, tend to make it a little more kitty friendly. And why? Because George Lucas, and I'm gonna to get to that guy later, George Lucas determined or proved that you can sell any toy related to your franchise to little kids and make more money off of the merchandising than you ever made off of box office sales. So there's an economic pressure to dumb down every good work of science fiction over time. Uh, it is not a coincidence as much as it is a good show, but it is not a coincidence that the most recently debuted Star Trek series, Star Trek Prodigy, is aimed directly at children. That is an a economic force that's, that's happening. It's an animated cartoon science fiction show aimed at kids with young protagonists within it. Um, anyways, so let's set aside 2001 A Space Odyssey. That also has a subtitle and it's a very apt title, A Space Odyssey, An Arduous Journey. And that's what it's about. It's a journey from here to there. If you want to talk about it philosophically, I'll just tell you uh, off the top of, uh, to, to, I'll give you a topic to discuss later. It's a retelling of the Christ myth. It's about rebirth, resurrection, and the salvation of humanity. That's what the book is about. If you didn't understand the movie, eh, that's what's going on. Uh, but Planet of the Apes is much more interesting. People tend to forget, I commend it to your attention. Go and watch it again, 1968, not the Tim Burton, remake, uh, and not the current films, although they do have some merit, but the original that stars, and this was very interesting, the first science fiction film in history to have an A-list cast. It starred Charlton Heston, who had already won the Academy Award for Best Lead Actor for, film buff here, Ben-Hur. He had won Ben-Hur, Best Lead Actor. And the lead co-star, although this is for uh, those of us who are very interested in feminist history, including myself in the audience, quite significant, although she is clearly the uh, secondary character, lead character in the film, she got uh, third billing and she got paid less than her co-star. Um, there are two major ape characters in the film. They are Dr. Zira and Dr. Cornelius. Dr. Cornelius is played by Roddy McDowell, and he got $50,000 to be in the film, which in 1968 or 67, when they actually produced the film, was a, you know, a good film. This was way before the $20 million salaries that actors command today. And Kim Hunter, who is Dr. Zira, who has many more lines in the film and is in the film for a much larger portion of the film, first time that we had a female uh, supporting actor in a science fiction film played by an Academy Award winner. Kim Hunter had won the Academy Award for Streetcar Named Desire. So we had an A-list cast. This was not a kiddie film. This was aimed at adults. And how do you know that it was aimed at adults? The very first ape that speaks a full sentence in the film is grousing to Dr. Zira. It's an, a, a male ape named Dr. Galen grousing to Dr. Zira. He says that uh, Zira had promised to talk to their supervisor, Dr. Zayas, about him. And she says, you know how he looks down his nose at chimpanzees. Well, we haven't yet learned that Dr. Zayas is an orangutan. We've already seen gorillas, now we've seen chimpanzees, we'll soon see orangutans. We see that we have a racially striated society. And Dr. Galen says, this is the very first dialogue in the film, he says, you do all right when it comes to getting research funding. And she says, that's because the military recognizes the value of my work. But she says to him, you shouldn't be complaining. The quota system has been abolished. The racial employment quota system. You have no glass ceiling anymore just because you happen to be a chimpanzee rather than an orangutan. 
at the top and gorillas at the bottom. And he dismisses that. This is a film, as Sammy Davis Jr. said to Arthur P. Jacobs, Sammy Davis Jr., long passed away, African-American singer, entertainer, uh, comedian, wonderful, wonderful uh, performer, said to Arthur P. Jacobs, the producer, this is the most significant film ever made about race relations. And that's what the film is about. Science fiction is never about 802, 701 AD, despite that being the putative year of uh, the time machine. It's never even about 2001, which was 33 years, 43 years in the future when, uh, when that film premiered, and now of course is 21 years in the past. It's always about the year when it's written as a script or as a novel. So Wells was talking to his contemporaries. And uh, uh, the novel that um, uh, Planet of the Apes is based on a French novel uh, by um, uh, Pierre Boulle, who uh, its novel is called La Planète de Sange. Uh, and Boulle was famous already because his previous novel had been, anybody know, very much aimed at adults, not at kids, turned into an Academy Award winning film starring Alec Guinness called The Bridge on the River Kwai. Right? Same author. This is a serious adult writer who wrote the novel. It came out in 1963 in French. Novel uh, made it into an English film in 1968. Uh, but the screenplay was by two of the most socially aware writers of that era. One was, and everybody knows this name, Rod Serling, who was the host and uh, uh, executive producer and creative mind behind The Twilight Zone, which was always doing this thing I talk about in terms of what science fiction's power is, doing social commentary. And the other was a man named Michael Wilson. Now, you may not know the name Michael Wilson, and the reason you don't know it is because he was blacklisted in the McCarthy era. And in fact, uh, A Planet of the Apes was uh, uh, the first time that he got his name back on a, a film. He had to do things uh, ghost-written. In fact, they gave the Academy Award, just parenthetically, for best screenplay to, uh, for um, Bridge on the River Kwai to Pierre Boulle. Boulle didn't write in English, barely spoke English. But Michael Wilson, who had written that screenplay, was barred from acknowledgement. Years later, years later, like in the last decade, the Academy finally gave a new uh, Oscar to his estate with his name on it for that screenplay. Great injustice. So these were people who came with a sense of social justice and they wanted to write about the two most important uh, societal issues of 1968. And they were, I've already alluded to one, race relations, 1968, the year Martin Luther King was assassinated. And again, no spoilers here, but the film is very much about the fear of nuclear war. Now, I tell you, you should read science fiction. I say, this is going to be wonderfully mind-expanding and get you a distant early warning system about what's coming down the pike in terms of social issues. The sad truth is, if two writers sat down today and wanted to write a novel about the most significant social issues of this year, 2022, they might very well pick race relations and the fear now ascendant with uh, Putin's uh, uh, belligerency uh, in uh, Europe uh, of nuclear war. So does science fiction serve a usefully predictive purpose? Well, there's a meme that you can see on Facebook, Margaret Atwood, my, my fellow Canadian, who sometimes admits to be a science fiction writer and sometimes does not. In fact, I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute. But, you know, she wrote The Handmaid's Tale, which came out in 1985. And, she, and there's a, a meme of her holding the book and talking about current politics in the United States, and I know I'm in a bluish city in a reddish state, but uh, forgive me because it's a meme that's, that goes across state lines and national lines. There's Margaret reading her book, holding up her book. It was not intended to be an instruction manual, and she's pointing to The Handmaid's Tale. Right? So science fiction has this ability to identify social issues that are going to be in the conversation for decades to come. We're hoping by identifying them early on or getting involved with the discussion that we can actually facilitate change. But what did I say about Britain today still not having their equivalent of the American dream? 
they still are very much a class-based society, um, way more so than we are here in North America. I just alluded to uh, Margaret Atwood, and oh, I said I'd tell you a story. So the Toronto Public Library is the largest public library system, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, in the world. It has 102 branches, more than the New York Public Library has. Um, and they give an annual award called the TPL, Toronto Public Library, celebrates reading award. And uh, I was lucky enough to win it some years ago. The previous winner had been Margaret Atwood, and it's given to the writer whose work has given the most pleasure to patrons of the library in the last year, so very nice. So Margaret, uh, part of the, the shtick of that award is the previous winner has to present it to the current winner. So Margaret, at this black tie, I'm in a tuxedo, a black tie ball, the book lover's ball, it was called a fundraiser, in Toronto uh, has to get up and say, and I, this is my Margaret Atwood, and I just want to say how happy I am to see this going to a science fiction writer. <laughs> and I said, Margaret, I just want to say how happy I am to be getting this from a science fiction writer. Because Margaret has had a famously fraught relationship with the genre science fiction. In Canada, she started out as a poet and as a writer for small press and so forth, and was thought of as our, our great uh, uh, Canadian writer, our great, uh, great Canadian writer, right up there with, you know, uh, um, Farley Mowat and some other names that only we Canadians still celebrate. Uh, and the irony is, of course, She's far, by far best known today for science fiction, her works that sci are science fiction. And she sort of eventually came around to recognizing. She used to say science fiction, science fiction is just talking squids in space, which is ridiculous. It was an unreasonable thing for her to say. And um, I, uh, I gave her a free pass until she started saying stuff like that. And then I actually was asked to review Oryx and Crake, which is not nearly as good a novel as The Handmaid's Tale. And uh, uh, wrote a, a quite negative review for the Ottawa Citizen, which is the uh, major daily paper in Canada's capital city of it. And she was interviewed, Margaret was interviewed on CBC Radio, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Radio. And uh, uh, Sheila Rogers, the host, said, what's the response to the book, Oryx and Crake, been? And Margaret said, well, everybody but Robert Sawyer likes it. Huh? <laughs> what can you do? I had to tell the truth, which is, if she was going to dismiss science fiction, because this was the brief I was given by the editor of uh, the book page of the Ottawa System, I said, there are lots of Atwood scholars. Why are you coming to me? And she says, well, uh, she said, uh, Jenny Jackson said, it's a science fiction book. Why don't you, we want somebody to review it as a science fiction book, whether or not Margaret Atwood admits it's a science fiction book. And by the lights of science fiction, Oryx and Crake is a crappy derivative uh, book. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote much the same material when he wrote The Island of Dr. Moreau about uh, genetic uh, engineering, genetic technology, and modifying uh, human beings. Anyways, enough about poor Margaret. Um, she's going to get the Nobel Prize soon enough anyway, so then she'll laugh at me again. She'll say, well, Swedish Academy, everybody but Robert Sawyer likes my books. So, <laughs> and I do like The Handmaid's Tale. It's a valuable, important book because it does what science fiction is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you think about social issues. I mentioned that the term science fiction was first coined in 1926. That isn't quite right. It was actually science fiction was the term that was originally coined. It was only a couple of years later that it got split into two words. But Hugo Gernsback was the guy who came up with that term. And we've been saddled with it ever since. It is not a good term. Um, obviously, you know the abbreviation sci-fi, right? I think that science fiction should more properly be referred to as philosophical fiction, because it's the, science, it's the literature of asking difficult questions about big ideas. You over here said that Frankenstein is often taught in philosophy courses, and that's true, but I didn't want you to, spoiler alert, get to my ending before I was there myself. So philosophical fiction, and you know, I mean, sci-fi, Fi-Fi, it's still a perfectly good name for the genre, P-H-I-F-I. -I. So I encourage you, and I'm going to wrap up just by saying here, but what about Star Wars? What about Star Wars? I hate Star Wars. The reason I hate Star Wars is not because there's one good film, which is Empire Strikes Back, 
One great film, Empire Strikes Back. One good film, A New Hope, which was the first one that came out in 77. And then so much garbage, it's unbelievable. And how many Death Stars are they going to make? And how many times are they going to rehash uh, Luke Skywalker's daddy issues. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. But there's no doubt that when most people think about science fiction, they ask, name a science fiction thing. Well, they say Star Wars. Star Wars is not science fiction. You can tell it's not science fiction. It is, in fact, fantasy. And why do you know that it's fantasy? By the way, just very quickly, the difference between science fiction and fantasy. Science fiction is about things that plausibly might happen. Fantasy is about things that never could happen. There is zero overlap between those two genres. It's only a, a historical accident that uh, I won't go into because I don't have time about why they tend to be linked together. Well, it has to do with, well, I will tell you very quickly, the first American edition of Lord of the Rings was pirated because under American copyright law at the time, if there was no domestic edition of a text that was otherwise available elsewhere in the world with an X uh, months of publication, then any American publisher could treat the book as public domain. And the first editions of Lord of the Rings were published by a science fiction imprint, and that's why the two genres are related. But nothing in Lord of the Rings ever could happen. It hinges on magic, which does not really work in the real world. Nothing in a good science fiction novel could ever could not happen. There's no overlap between the two. Anyways, George Lucas had wrote, created Star Wars, and I say it's, science, it's uh, fantasy cosplaying. Do you know that term? Fantasy cosplaying is science fiction. Costume playing, masquerading is science fiction. The key line is the very first one. Before that famous scroll that goes up into infinity, there's a single title card at the beginning of every Star Wars film. What is that? Yes, which has four ellipsis points after it when it should only have three. But yes, that's exactly right. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which is a paraphrase of what? The opening of fairy tales. A long time ago in a land far, far away. And in fact, if you look historically at the creation of Star Wars, it was originally um, meant to... Uh, Lucas knew that he was writing a fairy tale. And in fact, you have this very odd characterization of Princess Leia in Star Wars A New Hope, because half the time she has that title that I just gave her, Princess Leia. And the other half of the time, she's Senator Leia, Leia from Alderaan. And Lucas originally very much intended the damsel in distress fairy tale. And in fact, um, originally, Star Wars uh, tested, they tested it with audiences and uh, I won't go into all this. Anyways, it was not going to be the success until they retooled it and started presenting it as science fiction instead of as fantasy. There was no interest in 1977 with preview audiences for young men who in that era were the drivers of teenage going out. They were the ones who would ask the young woman in the 70s, do you want to go out to see a movie? And they would, you know, propose the movie. And obviously Fox knew that they had to have a movie that young men wanted to go see. And so they recast Princess Leia's role, as Senator Leia's role as a, prince, as a princess into a senator. They started emphasizing the science fictional aspects, the appearance of science fiction, and suddenly they had this huge blockbuster. And as everybody knows, the core demographic for filmgoers is teenagers and young adults. It's not... It's not anybody in this room. <laughs> so anyway, so Star Wars is not science fiction. If that's your only exposure to science fiction, haha, -ha, it's like somebody who gave you the common cold and tells you they gave you COVID. They did not. They only gave you the common cold. I don't know if this is the metaphor I want, that Star Wars <laughs> is the common cold and science fiction is COVID, but... Science fiction is intended to be an inoculation. Elvin Toffler, the author of the, 19, the first pop futurist, in fact, I believe he coined the term futurist, uh, who wrote the book Future Shock, which was a huge bestseller in the 70s and predates Star Wars. Elvin Toffler said science fiction is the only inoculation, the only preventive medicine for future shock. We all saw, those of us who read Margaret Atwood in 1985, the downfall 
uh, of women's reproductive autonomy. We all saw that race relations was going to continue to be an issue. We all saw that despite the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, that we would still be facing the specter of nuclear war. If you want to see what we're going to be grappling with in the future and start thinking about it today, then you should, as I say in the title of this talk, be one of everybody who should read science fiction. Thank you very much. Thank you.